rather than one defined path. The livestock was in good shape and they were really traveling well. A lot of times they'd start early in the morning, noon up, take a break at noon, let them rest, graze and forage, hook them up again and then go until late in the night. If they had a moonlit night and the trail was good and the weather was good, a lot of times they'd move on to good grass and good water. Just before sunset, the trail captain usually traveled ahead to find a suitable campsite. At his signal, the wagons formed a circle and the travelers made camp. They did form circles out of wagons uh, and brought them wheel to wheel as far as making a, a tight circle for the wagon, but for very simple practical purposes. It was, it was your portable fence that you could bring along by putting the wagons in a circle like that. So they did circle up wagons for evening encampments, but for that purpose of corralling livestock, not for defense against Indians. That was not necessary. Once the wagon circle was closed and the livestock were safely inside, the children ventured out to collect wood or buffalo chips to fuel the cooking fires. The men lowered the camp stoves and pitched their tents. The hunters would have already returned and butchered the game for the evening meal, which the women would quickly set about cooking. Within an hour, dinner was served. After dinner, the children played until bedtime, which was early out on the trail. On special occasions, or to relieve the tedium of the wagon train, there was often dancing around the campfires to fiddle or harmonica music, and there was often romance. Many a young couple met and married while traversing the Oregon Trail. As it made its way through what is now northeastern Kansas and southern Nebraska, the Oregon Trail followed the gentlest slope of the land where there was plenty of water. As a huge train of 1843 moved west, the air grew warmer and drier, the vegetation became sparse, and the lush forests of Missouri gave way to the wide open spaces of the Great Plains. About 300 miles out of Independence, the trail joined the Platte River. This, the river of sand, was often described as a thousand miles long and six inches deep. Its warm, muddy water was unpleasant to drink and often made the animals sick. But the wagons made good time along this stretch of the trail. Crossing rivers, and there were many between Missouri and Oregon, was a tedious and sometimes dangerous undertaking. It took hours for the wagon train to cross a simple, shallow ford. But crossing a deep, fast-running river could mean an eternity of unloading, caulking wagons, removing their wheels, and floating them across the treacherous currents then reloading them on the other side before moving on. littered with um, graves of all sizes. Uh, oftentimes they were very, very shallow graves. Um, again, it was a matter of, of having to press on and press on to get to your destination before winter snows. So um, oftentimes the graves were, were shallowly dug. The services over the dead were very, very brief um, to be held and, and then the wagons rolled out. The Oregon Trail has been called the world's longest graveyard. There is literally a body buried about every 80 yards out there. Uh, measles and smallpox were really deadly to the immigrants, and a tremendous number of deaths because of that. Although many people lost their lives to disease, most were killed because of sheer carelessness. Guns misfired in the jostling wagons. Children fell under rolling wagon wheels or were stepped on by oxen. Uh, there are cases of the wagons pulling steep grades and stopping on the hillside and the people trying to push them over and then the 
wagon rolling backwards over them. The mortality rate on the trail was appalling. Of the half million immigrants who went west between 1842 and 1866, one out of every 10 died. In hindsight, few of those first overlanders would have thought themselves capable of the cooperation and discipline necessary to make it across the trail. Few had traveled for more than a week at a time before. None had ventured into such a wilderness, and certainly none had faced death on a daily basis before. Sometime during June of 1843, somewhere along the Platte, home began to seem like a dream to the travelers. The sheer magnitude of their journey, the immensity of their undertaking was now beginning to sink in. Their wagon train had been on the move for more than two months now, and to most of the movers, the anticipated dangers of the trip, Indian attacks, disease, death, hadn't yet materialized. Instead, something more tangible began to take over their lives. Boredom. There was very little change as they traveled through this empty, vast plain. There was not a tree in sight, only shimmering haze and endless dust. The sun beat down day after day, mile after mile, until finally the wagons began rolling up the long slope toward the Rocky Mountains. By the time the immigrant train of 1843 reached the North Fork of the Platte River, the flat prairie landscape had given way to enormous clay and sandstone hills. Courthouse rock, chimney rock, castle rock, dome rock, and the great saddle shape of Scott's Bluff, named for a fur trader, Hiram Scott, who died there in the 1820s under mysterious circumstances. Virtually every passing immigrant took note of these wonders. The great natural formations must have touched something deep within their hearts. They were beginning to understand that they were part of a great movement and that their lives would never be the same again. To the awestruck immigrants from the east, one of the most startling spectacles they would encounter was their first sight of a buffalo. They had no doubt read about the buffalo, but none were quite prepared for the first time they saw the awesome creature in the wild. The bulls weighed nearly a ton, but despite their formidable size, they were usually docile. They provided the wagon train with many of the essentials needed on the trail. Although buffalo meat was tough, it was plentiful. The hides made good blankets, and dried droppings known as buffalo chips were adequate fuel when wood became hard to find. However, buffalo were known to stampede. When they did, a path of destruction was left in their wake. It was an experience the immigrants would not soon forget. But these travelers didn't have much time to wonder at the buffalo. June was passing quickly now, and Oregon was still 1,300 miles away. If they were to beat the early snows, they would have to hurry on to Fort Laramie. Fort Laramie was the last way station before the Oregon Trail headed up into the Rockies, and it was the point of no return for any immigrant who may now be thinking of heading back home. Sometimes uh, that did occur, uh, especially in the case of maybe um, the, uh, the head of a household dying along the way and uh, the decision being made, we can't go on without uh, this individual, and that they would turn around and go back. So most of the migration, most of the traffic was all one way. It was going from east to west. 
Fort Laramie was so busy during the peak of the migration that during one day alone in 1850, 6,034 people passed by its gates. As they moved west, the immigrant wagons left the Platte Valley, which they had followed for nearly 500 miles now, and joined the Sweetwater River as it wound its way toward the Continental Divide. As they ascended the mountains, the immigrants skirted the most famous point on the trail, Independence Rock. If you were to make Oregon before the snows fell, experts warned you would have to reach Independence Rock by July 4th. In spite of the urgency, many took the time to mark their names and the date they passed by on the rocks beside the trail. The wagons then drove on toward South Pass. By now, the movers were about halfway on their journey and July was slipping away. As the wagon train crested the Rockies, many never realized that they were standing on the top of the American continent. Early scouts had picked South Pass to cross the backbone of America for its gradual, even ascent to the 7,550-foot summit of the mountains. If it had not been for the easy grades here, chances are it would never have been possible to get wagons across the Rockies. A few miles west, at a spot called Parting of the Ways, the immigrants were forced to make a decision. In one direction, they could head on a direct route to Oregon via the sublet cutoff. In another, they could veer to the left and drop down toward Fort Bridger, a hundred miles away. Those who were headed for California veered to the left here. But the movers going to Oregon in 1843 decided against the shorter but more dangerous sublet cutoff. Instead, they went down past Fort Bridger with the others and split off towards the amazing hot springs at Bear Valley before passing through the sheer walled gorge of the Snake River. Ezra Meeker was a tireless pioneer who had settled in Oregon at the age of 22. In 1906, when he was 76, Meeker, his dog Joe, and two oxen pulled a wagon back east along the trail, backtracking all the way to Missouri. Meeker was a true promoter dedicated to preserving the trail and its history. He published a series of postcards featuring landmarks along the route. He raised money to erect stone markers along the way, and he was never shy about getting in front of a camera, as here, while he demonstrated the correct way to float a wagon across a river. he erected on that journey still stand today, a testament to the trail and the people who used it. September was passing quickly now as the wagon train of 1843 moved beyond Baker City. When it reached the Blue Mountains, foliage was so thick it took 40 axemen to chop a path for the wagons. The land was lush, their destination was within sight, and the travelers were getting anxious to end their journey. By the late fall, the wagon train was beginning to break apart. Some immigrants had bid farewell to the others and stayed to settle the towns of southern Idaho and eastern Oregon. But to those who ventured on, the weather turned cold and the rain seldom let up. But at least the snows had not yet come. Once the train reached the Hudson Bay trading post at the head of the Walla Walla River, most of the wagons had dispersed. Families whose animals still had the strength forced their way along the wooded paths beside the Columbia River. Many were sick, food was scarce, and the constant rains turned the trail into a river of mud. After coming this far, many immigrants wondered if they would ever make it to civilization in the Willamette Valley. 